In today's interview, we are talking about how to build a successful video production business. And today with me is Draja Stader, an award-winning director, cinematographer and CEO of media company Studio Production House. And he has more than 20 years of experiences crafting high-quality videos for uh, TV, commercials, web and so on. And this is why I am super excited to have you here. Uh, how are you, Drajan? Well, I'm feeling good. Ready to drop some knowledge bombs, I hope? Definitely. So let's, let's start with your story first. So as I've mentioned, you have more than 20 years of experiences. So what, I guess what we want to know is, where were you 20 years ago? And like, how, how did you start? Did you work as a freelancer first? Or did you, were you hired by some big company? And how was the film world uh, back then? Well, it's a great opening question, I have to say. 20 years ago, there was no YouTube. There was no online course cinematography knowledge that is so reachable as it is nowadays. And basically, after finishing high school, I went to film academy. I, I went through, you know, scholarship the usual way, you know, the boring way, as they say it right now. But it really felt good because I was immersed in the film world. I learned from people who've done it before. I had cool mentors and I had a lot of opportunities to totally, you know, mess things up, you know. I had the freedom to do shit. And this is something that is really precious mm -hmm. because you learn as you go. And the more you do the things that you love, the more you get to learn through trials and errors. And this is the way I slowly gain my knowledge. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, the funny thing is I, I, was, I was shooting always and I didn't have any clues what I was doing, you know. I, I mean, three-point lining, what is that, man? Yeah, I just knew I had, I loved the camera and I loved yeah. shooting as much as I could. Yeah. So I was analyzing, I was buying books, reading books, and when we started, we, most of my school exercises, they were done on film stocks. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is something that I truly appreciate having this opportunity because the film, it gives you a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. You have 10 minutes, a film roll, maybe for a certain exercise, you have two or three rows. It's not like I'm gonna shoot every single angle and then I'm gonna find my edit in the editor room. No, you had to pre-visualize, you had to prepare, you had to really know when to push record and to appreciate every single frame that you It was not done. like 100 attempts like today, you, you got to take the shot. So it was a lot about the planning, I guess. Def definitely. Okay. It, it, it taught me the, how precious is pre-planning. Mm -hmm. So basically when I, when I went out, I had already imagined the whole edit and I was shooting only the most essential things. So you were a student, you were in the film school. How did you then transition to, to, to work? Did you just like start working as a freelancer or how did that go? Well, grade one. So the following things, you know, the Film Academy as itself is a great stepping stone into the film industry because by the time you finish Academy, everybody knows you and you know everybody. Connections. You get connections, you get network, you get to meet the people from the industry. And along the way, you know, I, I've gathered a lot of uh, student film awards with my short films, nice. which kind of opened the gates to the film industry. By the time I finished Academy, I was already doing paid jobs. So were you, were you, so you did probably a lot of free jobs first to, to build your, up your portfolio before yeah. you got those paid gigs? Well, at the beginning of my career, if somebody, if like a human being on planet Earth mm -hmm. asked me, can I shoot something? Before hearing what it's all, the subject or the money, I said yes. Like, I said yes to every single human being on earth that was willing to work with me. I was willing to work okay, with Okay, because him. you wanted to build your portfolio, get as much I, stuff I wanted for your to portfolio, try okay. everything. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I was a shooting junkie and I still am today, you know, and <laughs> basically I grabbed every single opportunity mm -hmm. that came along. Gotcha. To get as much knowledge as I could from doing it, not just observing other people doing it. And, and so, okay, you finished the school because you did your work, you got some jobs, and then for how long did you work as a, as a freelancer? So did you work alone? Well, or, basically, or... basically, I founded a group of friends. Okay. We, we gathered together because we were passionate about making things look good. So basically, 
you know, one of the friends was a photographer, the other one was a designer, so we formed this creative group. So you all got different skills and you connected. We got different and, and we, we connected with each mm -hmm. other and we started doing music videos. Okay, so your niche was music videos first. At first, you know, it was music videos and whatever comes along. Yeah. But mainly it was music videos. You gotta pay pay those bills, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I guess you you guys connected and then how did your story continue to where it is today. You have, you got this big studio production, media company. So like, I guess, how did you know it was the right time to start hiring people? Uh, were you the only founder? Basically the beginnings of your uh, business. Mm -hmm. Great question. So basically for 10 years, mm -hmm. I, I had to learn everything, every single part of movie making before start hiring anybody else. So I learned how to direct, you know, I polished my director skills. I was always inclined more into cinematography, but along the way I did color grade, poster production, animation, graphics, and I learned a lot of skills while doing a whole variety of different stuff, mainly for TV broadcasting. This is the, uh, I think this is the field where I gained most of my professional skills by doing stuff for TV, because back then the web wasn't going strong. I was, it was a tiny little niche, and it had no respect from the industry. And Time's there wasn't, changed, a, yeah. yeah, and there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of content moving around the web. And always it feels great if you do content for TV because you get to see to be seen by a lot of people. Authority, exactly. So we did a couple of really successful TV shows. For example? For example, I did. I worked as a director of photography on Asitut, Asititut Motpada. No, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was the guy who shot yeah, all, all, every single piece of content for, for, uh, with, uh, with the comedy sketches that gained, and they're still gaining millions of views of on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was, uh, it, it took us, I think we had six seasons of that show. So it was a really, good learning ground because, uh, you know, learning while doing it and always trying to improve. And then I did a couple of reality TV shows, mm -hmm. which involve a lot of organizational and communicational skills because there is a lot of people involved and obviously the budgets got a little bit higher. So I was the leading DOP, but I also had to hire additional crew, additional cameramen, and they had to know exactly what's their purpose and what type of shots they had to get. You had to match different cameras. And slowly I merged and focused only on advertising, commercial, uh, directing and DOP. But it was a, you know, very step-by-step -step because you cannot get in advertising overnight because it's a very secluded, closed type of circle of people and you have to have work that proves you that you are qualified enough for doing directing and uh, doing the directing and the cinematography of uh, higher paid jobs. So obviously times changed, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you were starting out today. Uh, what are some of the mistakes that you see that beginner filmmakers do, so to say, when trying to grow their brand? And when they try to get in this closed circle, as you said, mm -hmm. where the skill level is very high, you know, the image quality needs to be there, the story needs to be there. And as you said, you need to have so many skills, directing, uh, filming, uh, managing people, everything. So can you give us some tips okay. uh, here? Well, I think that the newcomers, you know, and I respect them fully, they try to make a lot of shortcuts in, in order to gain, you know, it's very hard to avoid, despite the knowledge is uh, easy, easy reachable today. It's yeah. easily reachable yeah, yeah, today, yeah. but you know, at the end of the day, I think, this is my humble opinion, yeah. there is always the 10,000 hour rule. I mean, because... Patience, once, huh? Patience. And the other thing is, you know, how to uh, communicate your idea to the client. Okay. This is something that plays a really big role in getting hired mm -hmm. to do the whole production job for a good paying client. First off, you cannot just like go, obviously you have to be confident, but you have to learn the skill of listening to your needs of the client. 
I mean, the client is not impressed by your speed ramps and organic transitions, but he can be impressed if you listen to him too closely and you come up with creative solutions that serve him and not only your show real. So you need to identify the brand's problem and offer the solution. Exactly, exactly, that's it. So for me, when I go to a client meeting, I always love to ask a whole bunch of questions mm -hmm. and then just listen and try to feel the need of the client and then deliver on his needs and not on me wanting to just deliver another cinematic driven promo. Yeah, the best, I think the best sales meeting is where you ask the right questions and then shut up and listen and identify the problems. It, it's not about you and how cool can you can be, how cool shots you can get. It's about, it's about yeah. the client. It's always yeah. about them. Definitely, exactly as you said. Uh, so, what what do you mostly film today? So for web, like commercials or or. Mm -hmm. Well, our along the way we learn the art of saying no. So in uh, last year, I think this is the record year of no's in our production company because we. Uh, we are at a certain, I would say, mature stage okay. of uh, as a production group, a team of six people, and we know what we are a good fit for, mm -hmm. and we also know what we've done in the past, but we are not willing to do anymore. And you have, you have to know a, a thing about me. I've done everything mm -hmm. there is to be in terms of video. I've done weddings, you know, most of my colleagues, when they get approached to do weddings, no, come on, how could you? I've fucking done weddings, man. I've done like super low budget music videos. I've done, you know, a dozen of corporate films on different uh, budget levels. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I don't think there is a, in the book of video production, a simple, a single type of video, um, product that we haven't done. Already. You know the business. Inside out. And I'm always eager to try something new, but not more as like as a paid job. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want to explore stuff as a passion project where I have the full creative mm -hmm. freedom to do exactly things that I want to be, do. But on the paid side of the things, we are mainly specialized in advertising. Advertising, but advertising comes in many different flavors nowadays. It's not only advertising for the web. Uh, I mean, it's not all in the classical meaning for the TV, which is obviously the best, but I love the new emerging trends in web-driven content, in branded videos, in maybe in some creative testimonial videos, or in videos that deliver value to the audience, and, you know, suddenly, you know, you, you hear a lot of people like, marketing and advertising is not as it used to be. Nothing is as, as it once was. And you have to adapt with the really rapidly changing times in the advertising and produ production environment. That's how you survive in business. You have to adapt to, to trends. True that. So you talked about passion uh, projects. Uh, you recently started posting regularly on your YouTube channel, you're posting weekly content, right? So you can, can you tell us more about your YouTube? What kind of content are you posting? Why did you start your mm -hmm. posting there? Just Well, that's, that's right. We started with a weekly YouTube show called The Pro Filmmakers. And our main mission with this show is to empower people to become better, more skilled filmmakers and visual storytellers. You know, Many people, they feel, they feel kind of old school filmmakers, like how could you work with these guys, with these CLRs? I mean, they're cutting the prices down and everything, you know? They're kind of, no, I embrace those changes. I love the democracy that every, anyone has access to a full frame sensor and can deliver beautifully framed compositions and images. I think this is something we should all embrace. Good times very good times for everyone stepping into the film industry. But at the same time, you know, there is a lot of noise. And me and my boys are mission to cut through that noise with really creative on one side, but really 
thought out, engaging stories. Having competition is good because if you are good, this, the, then you can position yourself even easier. I mean, competition is beautiful. It brings the best and it, and it keeps me, you know, moving forward, mm -hmm. you know? And this is the reason I always chuck, you know, I, my source of inspirations are YouTube and Vimeo. Also, to a certain extent, also the movies. For, who are you, some of your uh, favorite filmmakers? Uh, sorry, I cut you there. No, no, no it's, you, it's, you it's cool. About well, in, terms, in terms of films, I love the Guy Ritchie approach. I love the Martin Scorsese, which is my main mentor. And in terms of YouTube, I would definitely consider guys like Sam Coder, guys like uh, G.R. Ali. Yeah, uh, I, I, I love I love the cinematic approach of the band TQ, mm -hmm. and there is a whole lot of of course Peter McKinnon, you know, is but he, he's the the people's favorite, but you know along him I mean these three guys they really caught my attention really and there is a lot out, yeah. a lot to learn from I mean on YouTube and they're so young right they're young and they're creative and you know this is you know they i love i simply love the way they approach storytelling let's go back to your youtube channel so one of my favorite videos of yours is the passion project yes or no and where you basically talk about how to how to succeed as a filmmaker and you mention a spec spot mm -hmm. you have to have one uh, can you tell our audience what is it, why is it important, and how can they implement it into their uh, success? Okay, I think the spec spot, this is the way I like to approach it and to define it. It's like your entrance ticket mm -hmm. into the higher paid jobs. Mm -hmm. But in order to prove yourself, you know, you in, in the advertising work, it's always the same. You have a client, he has a certain budget, that it's usually a bigger budget than any, anything that you had access before, but in order for him to hire you, he has to see that you have already done a car commercial if you want to establish yourself as a car commercial director. Or for me, uh, the, the thing I really love shooting is lifestyle and fashion. And for me, for someone, for a higher paid client to hire me as a lifestyle fashion director, he wants to see the exact same thing on my showreel. I mean, basically it's the same if you would hire a construction worker to build your house. Who would you choose? Like, and there is this guy on the other side who already the, made the exact same building or house that you want to live in. And there is this guy who's obviously full of himself and confident, but he has nothing, nothing to show. Nothing to show for, huh? Yeah. So. And the same logistics applies in the world of commercial directing. I mean, me, I already won, I, I already did one car commercial, but that's not nearly enough for a big brand like BMW or Mercedes to hire me for the next car commercial. I would need at least three to four car commercials on my reel and it would go, okay, this is, he is a good candidate. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't qualify me as the, the pick me up, like he's a good candidate. So in commercials, basically nowadays, everyone is specialized of the, in something in a niche. Mm -hmm. You have lifestyle, comedy, family directors, you have car commercial directors, and so on and so on. So what would you suggest is to beginner filmmakers is to build their, to choose their niche? Definitely. And they just, if they don't get a budget from a client, they need to do it for free, mm -hmm. rent uh, some good gear on their expenses and build a portfolio, a spec spot, something to show for. Definitely, I mean, Ask yourself, you know, take a moment to reflect. A little bit of self-awareness self really helps. Yeah, that's not what is the niche I'm truly passionate about? That's a what tough is question, the, the niche that I'm willing to go all in? What is the niche I'm prepared to invest my money, time and energy? What is the niche I will make 100 phone calls, ask all my friends if they have time to join me on this venture to make the best possible spot that will prove me as a really, you know, professional in that field. So what were some of the things that you did in your business that really got the momentum going on for you? Was it reaching out to the right people? Was it like building a really good uh, uh, spec spot video or like what were those breakthrough things, so to say? Well, I think the breakthrough things that are still going on. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I feel that every project that I do is a breakthrough. Is a stepping stone to something. Is a stepping stone because in our business, you are judged not by the 20, 30 latest work that you did, by the but, you're, but you are always judged by the last one. So me and my team, we have a saying that every single frame counts. And this is something that I'm deeply believing in. And this is the way I operate with my crew uh, and my team. We go all in. All in in every shot. In every shot, in every project. Because if I'm not willing to go all in, then it's a no. It's, if, it's not, if it's not a hell yes, then it's sorry, we are busy. And you know, there is plenty of options down around and someone can take maybe better care of that project uh, than us. Who did you hire first as your team member? Uh, the, I mean, the role. Yeah. And the In system. a production company, definitely there is uh, mm, the project leader, mm -hmm. someone who would communicate and talk to the client instead of me once, okay. once the project is approved. Oh, okay. So it's our project leader. Uh -huh. So because, you know, the journey with the client is a long one. Yeah. And it's, uh, it takes time to build a relationship and it's always nice to see a happy client that is coming back. Recurring revenue. Recurring revenue, definitely. And, you know, building long-term relationship, this is one of the foundation of Studio Production House. And successful business. Definitely. And obviously there is a ton of work that is not sexy, that is dull, but it has to be done in For terms example, of agreements, like agreements, agreements. Uh, tiny little details that you would put in an agreement. This is not, you know, the thing that you would make a YouTube tutorial for because it would get a really tiny amount of views and it's not sexy as the gear, definitely, but it's a really foundational step in order to run a successful business on the long term. Uh, and like, do you have any other income streams or do you just sell videos or is there anything yeah. else? Yeah, you already know me a little bit, but let me, let me add, let me explain our viewers. Yeah. I'm a tech geek, you know, and during my 20 year journey, every single buck that I made, I reinvested back into the company. I wasn't going on luxurious holidays. You know, I wanted to grow because when you start, it's like having this little tiny baby, you know, he's learning how to walk, then learning how to speak. And if you're not treating him with good ingredients, you're not giving him the option to grow. So basically for me, I always liked having my own equipment. And along the way, we built a professional rental video company called the Pro Video Rentals that allows me now to, you know, to come to set fully equipped. I mean, on the last shooting set that we did... Hollywood, um, literally. Yeah, I mean, I knew that having two red cameras instead of just one would really help me get all the angles and the shots within the time frame. Timing, efficiency, different perspectives. Everything. And obviously, I couldn't convince the client, you know, to pay for the second camera. So when you are having those tools at your disposal, you can act as a co-producer. And this is what we are doing. We are investing our own equipment as co-producing the spot that have a creative potential to make them really, you know, shine. That's what we do. But not, not all on all of this, you know, because I, there are certain clients that I really uh, feel it's a long-term relationship, so I'm willing to treat them well, you know? You always need to over-deliver, right? True that, true that. Happy we, client, successful business. Exactly. I mean, definitely a good strategy to have is to under-promise and over-deliver and not the other way around. I hope no the clients problem. are not listening <laughs> about it. I, I mean, okay. you but know... But that's, 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 the, that's how the business is I done. I mean, I'm just yeah. speaking the truth. This is, I, I'm not trying to make the perfect image of a perfect world and perfect clients because it doesn't exist. That's the reality. That's the reality. And let's, you know, let's approach the reality to all the newcomers so that, you know, it's, it's a beautiful job, especially if you love it, but it's going to take uh, quite a time to, to adapt to the reality. I think one of the toughest questions and struggles that beginners have is pricing. Pricing, right. yeah. So, 
uh, if we are being like completely honest and transparent, can you give us some tips to the audience about how much should they charge at the beginning, how to scale that pricing, when is the good time to start raising that, their prices, mm -hmm. just some general pricing guidelines, because that again is the foundation of a business. You mm -hmm. need to know when and how to grow it. Okay, there is this perfect scenario when you know it's time that you need to rise your prices. And it comes with when you get overloaded with lower paid jobs mm -hmm. that you can you can handle all of them. This is like a sign, oh, maybe it's time that I should I can raise my prices. And what are for example, what are the ranges in this lower in, in general in industry I think the, in Europe? The over ranges, you know, for a camera and shooter like a DSLR in Slovenia, I mean because de definitely it depends on the territory. Slovenia is like a medium budget in Europe. Medium budget, say, it, yeah. it starts 150 to 200 euros per day without the equipment. Mm -hmm. And then you when you reach that level that you are getting constantly higher on that level from 150 to 200 as a camera operator, it's a good time you know, to make a selection of best paid clients and to gently inform them that with the beginning of the new year or with the beginning of the summer season, you are raising your prices. Because you cannot physically, you, you gotta know, make a take, selection of the clients. You have to, it's, it's a natural progression, let's yeah, call it this way. Yeah. So it's a natural progression and then you slowly climb the value ladder, you know, you scale it up. And uh, the higher the prices, I mean, the, the less amount of clients you're gonna have. But, you know, you're gonna have time to, to, to devote to passion projects maybe, and to, you know, to get higher paid jobs. And what are, like, I know it's very specific from client to client, but for example, what are some of the budgets on, on this big, high-end uh, productions? Well, me and my team, we have a daily fee that starts around 3,000 euros. And that includes uh, Yeah, it, 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 it includes me, it includes my team, and it... The it, whole gear? Yeah, the majority, the majority. If, if it's not like something special. And basically, for me, one of the questions that I ask myself, can this project handle 3,000 euros per day? Mm -hmm. If it can't, and I think we are deli over delivering on that promise because I once that, I definitely. list everything that we bring with us on the set, it's I mean, very it's very good price for the client. Way, way, way over that price. Because, but on the other hand, you know, for me, you know, the approach is you gotta keep moving mm -hmm. because, you know, saying endless no's will, you know, ruin your business. It, it won't make your business, but it, it will ruin your business Sometimes because you take a suddenly you, you, want, you will have the aura, he's not approachable, he's always busy. No, you, that's not the message I want to send to our clients, but I want to send the message that I'm sending to our clients is there is a certain level, there is a certain level of production that I need to fulfill in order to keep the reputation and the brand of Studio Production House. And this brand starts with 3,000 euros per day and scales up depending on the nature of the project. And for post-production, how do you break it down? It depends. But the first question that I ask in post-production, is there any 3D involved? Because we don't do 3D. And if there is 3D involved, it means that I have to outsource. If it's a, like a general type of post-production project with some basic, neat, elegant graphics and a very good, color grading, then me and my team, we are handling the project from the beginning to the very end. No problem. Thank you for the transparency. I hope... Uh, You're welcome. Of course it helped. Uh, so you said you're a tech uh, nerd, right? I am a we, tech we, nerd. We I gear. confess, I love, gear. love gear. I watch... I probably watch too much YouTube oh, tutorials man. on tell, gear. Tell me about it, yeah. Then I have to remind myself, you know, I mean, gear is not important. No, yeah, gear is and it isn't, it's like that. It's to a certain extent, Yeah. to a certain extent. But nowadays, you know, I get a lot of phone calls and people, they just keep, what's the best camera that I should buy? I mean, it's really hard to, to make a bad purchase nowadays because there are so many good cameras out there. And this is something that I to constantly keep reminding myself, you know, enough time spent on the gear, searching what's the best camera, because 
you know, holding as you I, back. As I explained, I'm also running a video production rental mm -hmm. business, and this is something that you have to keep track. So this is a very good excuse for me to keep track of the latest technology because I need to know what the market wants and what are the best investments for us as a rental company in order to deliver to our to the people wanting to rent the, the gear from us. So, how would you like approach getting the gear? Like, can you like tell me? I'm a beginner filmmaker, what gear should I invest in and why? How should then I scale it, let's say to an intermediate, and then how should I then scale it? Should I rent first, buy it? Like, what, what's the, in your opinion, the best path to go? Yeah, I have a great question. Rent every, from you. <laughs> I have a great question yeah. every time I feel the itch to invest into the gear. The question is, it's very simple, but it works. Who is paying for the gear? Who is paying for the gear? Who is paying for the gear? I mean, and will this gear offer anything of value to our clients? Mm -hmm. Those are the two main questions. And this is the criteria that really works. Because if you invest into, let's say, RE camera, which means 50,000 euros and up for the whole system, is there anyone on your paying client list who's willing to hire Mm -hmm. the Ari camera from you. Mm -hmm. If not, you are doing yourself and your company a big disservice because obviously there is this ego thing, I want to have Ari because it has the beautiful skin tones and everything else. And, you know, people tend to over-invest in certain parts of the gear that really is barely noticeable to the viewer. For example? Glass. glass. Cinema glass is, I mean, is dirty expensive. You can go like investing into cinema glass and one glass on the low end is around 3,000, 4,000 euro per single pro per single price. On the lens. low end, yeah. Yeah. But then on the, you know, I always, the good thing is I always love to, to call my wife. Can you, can you see any difference? Because my wife, she's basically, you know, she's like an average client. She's watching the finished piece, but I cannot see any meaningful difference. I do the same with yeah. my wife, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's a good to have an average viewer because with all due respect to my uh, clients, mm -hmm. they see the finished work. They're not overwhelmed with technology. They, If it looks good to my client, then it looks good to me. So basically, I'm really being rational about investing in certain types of gear. On the other hand, investing into a system, a new system like FPV, mm -hmm. it's something that every single human being on Earth, we say, oh wow, this is something special. How did you do this shot? Mm -hmm. Because it's so cinematic, it flies you, you know, through tiny little spots, you, you can immerse your viewer and offer them a completely new experience. It's becoming a trend because it's a completely unique perspective. It's, yeah. it's, new, unique, it's, uh, it's a very unique perspective and everybody can see it. And then I know it, this is something that's worth investing my, my time, energy, and money. So yeah, as you've mentioned, it, it makes no sense to buy expensive uh, cinema cameras if you don't have a client to pay for it. But on the other hand, if you want to get that client, you need to have a cinema camera because that's just the commercial world, the world, the high end. So what would you suggest in that situation to rent it first? I would definitely suggest renting higher priced cameras. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not running already a really established production business, it doesn't make no sense of you investing tens of thousands of dollars into a system that in two years you will have to upgrade. Because this is something, you know, it's a really fast paced industry and you know, new sensors are coming, new cameras are coming. So you basically always have to get the, the latest gear. Mm -hmm. and this race is very expensive. So, you know, if you're shooting higher paid jobs every now and then, I would definitely rent the equipment, try it out if you like it, and then the more you establish your business, then you can start, you know, planning future investments. I think this would be the smart way to do it. Uh, we saved the best for the last. So it's quite a broad question, but I guess, can you give us some insights about 
how your whole process looks like. So from uh, first communication with the client, pre-production, like uh, creating a storyboard, deciding who you need on the set, the whole organization on the filming day and the post-production, basically the workflow recap of the whole commercial uh, project. Okay, let's try it out. So basically, when I receive the call, usually we have two types of clients, the hot clients and the clients we already worked with, mm -hmm. which makes everything so much easier, easier because yeah. there is always already a sense of trust and relationship and I have so much more freedom. Or is it a completely new client that's calling us for the first time, asking for a quote, asking for the estimate? Let's go with the new one. Well, let's go with the new one. And the funny thing is, it's uh, like, you get some kind of script, okay? Usually it's a working in progress. It's a work in progress, it's not a finished script. And that's good because if it's a work in progress script, it means that we can add our creative insights into it. We, we can add it up, we can change it a little bit, polish it. And then there is this estimate. And usually the client goes, wow, this is much more than we expected. Okay, but without that first estimate, you will never know how much the client was willing to invest into a project. At the so, first. do you usually quote the price first? Yeah, I'm the one. You're the one. Okay, I'm the one because uh, I have so much experience on set. I mean, tens of thousands of hours that I usually can really predict with certainty what I need to deliver a really high end quality end product. So I hop on the phone with the client and I go, okay, this is, this over, is over exceeding your expectations and what is the budget that you have planned for it? And then he goes, well, we kind of plan the da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And then there is, you have to decide. Either you kind of tune down, you know, the production value of the script to fit the budget and what are usually the things, the first things that you... I mean, if he goes, the client goes, we want to have the scene on the highway, mm -hmm. which is, means blocking the road, hiring, you know, a lot of production people in order to... I go, can this story work in a tiny little street, maybe some, somewhere not in the urban area, mm -hmm. and we, will see, we can still deliver the same story to the, to, the, to the viewer, but we are cutting off like two, three, four thousand euros in costs. And he goes, well, this story can work everywhere. So we say, perfect, because many times the client, they're not as skilled in producing video content as we are, and we, we, we need to help them. You are the expert. I am the expert, and I need to lead him to kind of creative solution that's not, uh, you know, sacrificing the power of the story. So that's, you know, I'm trying to meet the client halfway. Gotcha. How do, you, how, how do you then progress? So, okay, you got the storyboard, and then comes the shooting day. Yeah. On higher paid jobs, we have storyboards. On medium paid jobs, usually the way I love to approach is to go on the relocation of mm -hmm. the shooting and basically use, and with the help of my team, we kind of storyboard with a with DSLR. Mm -hmm. This is something that in many occasions delivers better result than the storyboard. Mm -hmm. But why is that so? In because your you know the storyboard they tend to be perfect. And you can make a perfect drawing, but if you cannot replicate that drawing into a real production environment, what happens is that you're over promising and under delivering. And the client can go at the end, but the storyboard looked like this and you delivered this. And you say, yeah, but we didn't have this house disposal, and you so can it's have better to do location scouting yeah, in it, reality. You and... start throwing, you know, excuses to the client, and he just doesn't care because he saw a picture that you know overpromised, and you underdelivered. On the other hand, when you go to relocation, this is a pretty much the feeling he will get, and obviously it will be much, much better once you put your composition and lighting and 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 talents in place. Nice. Uh, and then on the shoot day, you go through the story and, and, and shoot it. Obviously, who are some of the people that help you on the set? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I want to I add something on the shooting side. Yeah. You have to be prepared, mm -hmm. obviously, because under preparing on a client's job is a disaster. But when you are over prepared, you might missing, you might be missing really delicious little hidden moments mm -hmm. that you couldn't predict before because you, you didn't have your full crew and talents and everything else. So I love to prepare, but then leave 10 to 15% of the production to pure improvisation. Being spontaneous in the Being moment. spontaneous and watching the scene unfold in real time. Because you, you might find a shot that wasn't in the storyboard. And if you stick only to your storyboard, you can miss the best shots of the day. And that's the creative freedom that clients that already trust you. Exactly, you, and I mean, you. the clients are intelligent human beings. I really respect my clients. And if you, if you can offer him something really good on the spot, I mean, you are not the only one who can know, the, who can appreciate the charm and the magic of a well-composed cinematic shot. I mean, he would go, good, this is good stuff, man. I'm glad you found it. It's like a, a cherry on top. They trust you. They trust you. Uh, and what are usually the deliverables uh, in commercial work? Yeah, the deliverables, they, they vary, but you know, the usual package would include master versions for TV distribution, then uh, MP4 format for web distribution, mm -hmm. and nowadays they also include maybe some Instagram stories, uh, vertical, vertical format. To get, to get the traffic coming from these uh, new platforms such as Facebook stories, Instagram stories. So basically a lot of, you know, it's kind of, of a challenge of composing the shot for the vertical, for, for the nine by 16, but occasionally it, it can look really good. But you have to have that in mind before shooting. No, to, I, usually, to, or, or, usually to tell you the truth, no. I'm, I, I can only focus on one format, one format. and the other okay. one, has to be, he has to adapt to the main format. But if you have, for example, a tight portrait shot, it can be challenging in the vertical, but yeah. that's just uh, the reality. And how long are usually these videos for commercials? Are these 30 seconds, 60 seconds videos? Yeah, for, for TV, the majority part of the, the 15 project, even. 15 to 30 seconds, mm -hmm. that's TV. And for web, it's up to two minutes, anything in between. Usually they, they love to have cut downs, if they go, if they're doing uh, YouTube and Instagram advertising, it's great to have a web version that is some 15 to 30 seconds. And for this main, main image video, it's up to 90 seconds at occasions, up to two minutes. But usually 90 seconds, I think it's the sweet spot. To keep the viewer's yeah. attention. Yeah. Uh, one last question, the uh, question that popped in my head is, uh, so we talked before that you have to identify the problem that the clients have, right? Mm -hmm. So what type of videos do you usually create for them? Are these uh, videos that help sell or uh, help promote brand awareness? Like just what, what, are, what type of videos uh, do clients get in commercial work? Usually the stuff that we do is branded video content that builds the brand. It's an image video, you know, that fools, it's full up of cinematic quality and it doesn't need to sell. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm noticing a trend that suddenly the clients, they're realizing they need a whole variety of different, besides brand building videos, they need maybe a testimonial, mm -hmm. they need a, a, a video that delivers value. So they're getting aware there is power in the online video, but not only as an image video like, look how cool we are, but no, this is the service that we can deliver that can help you out. So basically, now we are, you know, in expanding a little bit the the deliverables for every single client, and this is good. I mean, the more the more different uh, types of videos they they you you can offer, the more you can charge. Exactly, and I guess what brands really need is the content that will help them connect with their audience. Yeah, I mean the brands also realized one thing that they, the brand video is not the only thing that they need but they need weekly content that keeps their viewers engaged and relevant and relevant <laughs> Drajan, thank you so much for you. taking your time and sharing so many valuable informations with us 
uh, go subscribe to Drazen's uh, channel. Pro uh, Filmmakers. Pro guys. Filmmakers uh, to get more valuable content like this. If you have any questions, comment below. We are more than happy to help you out. Uh, have a nice day and I will see you. We will see you. Yeah, in, definitely. In our next videos. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.